So if you're looking at your programs this morning, just want you to note uh, one small change since we are in New York and just this close to Broadway, I'd let you know that the part of Lily Varen today will be played by Cheryl Paddock. <laughs> she is the Vice President of Executive Programs for Forrester Research. Cheryl will be sharing her insights on data and into how evolving customer expectations set the stage for real-time payments. Cheryl? Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So I hope that all of you are as excited to be here as I am. 18 months of not being in front of a group of clients face-to-face -face has been um, quite challenging. I spent my life before the pandemic traveling every week to clients. And then it's been the life of the video and staring at people on a video screen, which if you're like me, that kind of leaves quite a bit to be desired and looking at um, people's language and how they are um, understanding the content that you're looking to share. So today, um, I am not Lily Vernon, and Lily is our analyst that covers the space that you all are talking about. So I'm going to do my very best to take her content and bring it to life for you. And my role at Forrester is much more about operationalizing much of our research for clients. So I'm going to weave in some examples and some points that helps you kind of take the content from our research and bring it to life. And there is a little bit of audience participation. So based on that I'm a small person, those lights are exactly in my eyes. So I can't um, see everyone. So when I ask for audience participation, please go like this and say, yes, I have an answer, or just call it out since I um, can't see everyone. So we'll talk about today whether or not consumers really are ready for real-time payments. Um, and with that, I'm going to get started. If the clicker will click, click, clicker, ah, there we go. Okay, so during the time I have with you this morning, we're going to spend a little bit of time in doing some time travel. We'll talk about how we've gotten to where we are today, a little bit of the past. Then we'll take a glimpse into the future. And then when I finish this morning, we'll kind of come back to the present and I'll leave you with some thoughts going forward from where we are today. Okay, so here comes the audience participation part. Wireless service providers made SMS or text messaging available to mobile consumers in what year? Who wants to guess? It's not audience participation if nobody answers. Uh, close. 94 was close. Anyone think it was a little bit earlier? Nope. Ah, who said 92? Raise your hand because I can't see. Okay. If I had a prize, you would win it. <laughs> it actually was in 1992. And it seems like, my God, that was a long time ago for SMS to be, whoops, for SMS to have been introduced to consumers. 92 was also an important year for a couple of other reasons. The um, shuttle Endeavor was launched in 92. The tenth wonder of the world, for those of you that are not, um, that don't live in the US, there is this big monstrosity of a mall in Minnesota called the Mall of the Americas. And those of us that live in the US think of that as the tenth wonder of the world because of its size. It was also the year that um, Aladdin launched on for Disney launched it in the movies. And if you look around the corner in one of the theaters here, Aladdin is still alive and well. And finally, it was also the year that um, McDonald's expanded internationally into China. So quite a lot happened in 1992. And on a personal level, my only child turned two in 1992 and became that terrible toddler of two. So let's fast forward to 2004. And here's another audience participation. What percentage of consumers do you think were active users of SMS and text messaging 12 years after 92? 10%. How much? 10%. Good guess. Anybody else? 15? 
Anyone else? 50. 50? All right, good guesses. But it may surprise you that it was only 2%. 12 years and only 2% of consumers actually started using SMS and text messaging. It's a really hard concept for us to kind of get our head around today because today our world lives on text messaging. I now have a 30-year-old who I'm lucky if I speak to her once every three weeks, but we text message almost every day. Now, why do you think that would happen? Why only 2% of people would have actually use text messaging after 12 years? I'm sorry? Terrible user interface is one good reason. The other reason at Forrester, we have a concept that we've done quite a bit of work around that is also this idea called loss aversion. And if you think about psychological impact and economic research, there is this idea that um, consumers believe that if they want to introduce anything new to their life, they have to lose something else. And that perception is that the loss is much greater than the gain. So when text messaging came into, into being and was introduced, there was this perception that it was hard to use, there was a cost to it, and there was no real benefit, and this idea that you would lose something else and you have to give up something else that was important to you. And in fact, that our minds actually amplify that perceived loss to when something small that we want to introduce that's new in our lives, we multiply that to say that we have to give up two to five times more something that we're doing in order to incorporate something else. So while it might seem strange, you can think about how long, bless you, how long it's taken for text messaging to become part of our lives. Consumers had to get over this idea that there was something they were gonna lose to improve their overall, ex overall experience. So why do we think that actually happened? And what has changed since then? We continue to evolve as people and as society but the adoption of new things no longer has that perceived cost to it. We're in this world that Forrester we call the world of digital disruption and also a world where consumers are in this mode of hyper adoption where they now want to try new things because that perceived necessity of loss has really decreased because the cost of trying new things has gone to just about zero. And as we've seen about the pandemic, it's forced consumers to try new things because of some of the um, operational issues around the pandemic where life has changed overnight. And this idea of loss aversion and, and the decrease of what you have to give up as a consumer really goes to the heart of what we'll be talking about about real-time payments. So when we find these consumers now believe that they um, no longer have this idea of loss aversions, we find that they're now connecting on three different dimensions to access communication, content, services, and actually think about payment. And those three are around devices, around platforms, and around channels. And here comes another audience participation. On average, in the US, Consumers are connected to how many devices do you think? Eight. think eight. 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 Anyone else? There you go. <laughs> 4.7 devices on average. If you think about your phone, the, um, your tablet, your watch, your speaker, your TV, I'm already up to five. How many? I'm sorry? Your car, which we'll actually talk about in a little while. So think about your personal life for a second and just raise your hand if you have more than 4.7 devices that you're connected to. Most of you, right? Um, then if we think about platforms, it's actually 4.4 platforms on average, which I also think is pretty low when you start to think about Facebook, even though it didn't work most of yesterday. So 4.4 platforms, 
even though Facebook didn't work yesterday, if we think about Twitter, we think about Instagram, consumers don't really think about channels. So we think that this number is way understated. When we think about channels, we're finding that there are more and more channels coming into being that is our enabling consumers to engage with those channels that actually um, impacts the necessity for real-time payments. And one of the things that we see emerging is that consumers are engaging with and buying from shop shoppable videos. And we see that 55% of consumers have said that they're actually making a purchase off of a shoppable video. Now, that may seem surprising that the number is so high, but doing real-time and um, ongoing payment off of a video is not really that new. While it may not be a video, if we go back in time and we think about QVC and Home Shopping Network and what's been on TV for quite a long time, consumers have shopped and made real-time payment on TV for their, for their goods and services. And those consumers are very loyal to QVC and to Home Shopping Network. On our research from that we do our own customer satisfaction and customer experience index, those, those, two, um, ability, those two ways for consumers to buy products and services have always scored really, really high in our, um, in our customer experience index. And then we find that along the same vein, when we look at consumers that are now online gaming and we think about that application Twitch, we find that 35% of consumers that have engaged with Twitch are doing online gaming and are actually interacting with that game and actually streaming some of their own game. And while there may not be the platform and the infrastructure for real-time payments, in, in essence there are because those consumers are sharing microcurrency in terms of credits for behaviors that they've done on those games. And there is a whole ability to share back and forth those payments for their time and, and their energy. So just some examples of where we've been. Now, COVID has caused, was that fault line that caused a dynamic shift in digital payments. So if we look at this slide that's up here and you see about what's happened during COVID and, and customers' comfort level across the world in terms of Canada, the UK, and the US of doing contactless payments, and here's where I could have used a, a pointer, and we look at this, we see for the first time people have really made payments in stores with credit cards, payment in store with, with my iPhone, or online or mobile bill pay. And just for a second, the, let's talk about the mobile bill pay piece. Um, and let's take a look at the impact of what that mobile bill pay is having. When it's not real time, we find that 50% of the calls to call centers are now about errors in bill pay as resulting from consumers doing mobile bill pay. And why? It's because that bill pay is not real time and on the back end, it's not crediting those consumers in a real time basis. So what you find is that consumers will do mobile bill pay, then they'll get a notice from the vendor that their bill isn't paid, they'll pay it again. And then they'll get another notice and they'll pay it again. And then we get into this whole dialogue of credits back and forth from the vendor and the, the consumer and that behavior is way less positive for that consumer. So when we start to thinking about real-time payments, it, it becomes absolutely essential to make sure we d use those real-time payments to help deliver the best customer experience possible. Okay, working, yes. So many new adopters will remain on those digital services. As a result of the pandemic and 18 months of behavior and positive behavior for the most part on how the economy was able to work in new ways during the pandemic means that those customers will continue to use these real-time services. Many customers will use, continue to use digital banking. They will continue to use digital or contactless payment. Almost 
50% of consumers will do that, and they will continue to buy groceries online and ordering restaurant delivery. If you were outside at all yesterday or when you arrived on Sunday, you see in New York, what you see now today is almost as many bicycles with um, delivery for restaurants as you see taxis today because that um, ability to do online restaurant delivery has become so pervasive and the likelihood is it will not be going away. Okay, so we've taken a look at some of the trends that we see in the marketplace for consumers today. Now let's take a look into the future and what we see coming in the future. So we also believe that Amazon has a beachhead in people's homes and in cars. 25% of consumers have a speaker or a um, Amazon or Google Home speaker in their homes today that enables them to interact via voice. So what that means is that voice is now becoming um, a critical component adding to those channels and adding to the way that consumers decide to interact with vendors and be able to now order product or say, pay my bill, do this, do that. Um, we also now see, as many of you probably know, that the way that Amazon is connected now to connected refrigerators, connected, connected um, washing machines, and the ability to sense ahead of time whether or not a consumer needs some, some supplies in their refrigerator or in their washing machine and automatically order it and then bill that consumer and have them pay all like that. So we find that those payments are now integrated into our everyday lives, making that transition from payment as a transaction with a specific start and stop to payment as an ongoing part of a consumer's lives. So if we take that one step further and we look at when Amazon opened the first Go store in 2000, and 18, what we saw at the beginning was you had a QR code that you had to hold up, and then that QR code let you into that Amazon Go store, and then you were able to purchase and take your items and leave. Well, now Amazon is taking that to a new level with contactless payment, where with biometrics, your palm is now your entrance into that store. And again, that payment becomes part of the ongoing experience that that consumer is having as they choose things from Amazon Go Store and then walk out, which is a little bit different than the Amazon online experience where the consumer is going on to Amazon, buying something and having it delivered. This is an, a real time, I need stuff, I'm gonna do my palm print with biometrics, I'm gonna pick up my stuff and walk out and not have to worry about how that payment on the back end is happening because it's all instantaneous. In, in, for WeChat, they actually have gone one step further. And this um, application that's called Frog Pro uses facial recognition as a biometric for real-time payment. Now, great idea, but what's happening as a result of this is people don't really like what they look like in real-time payment. And if you've ever used Clear as an application, you know get, getting through security, it's something very similar losing, using biometrics. I actually use my eyes in Clear, and I always look at the photo that comes up, and I go, wow, was that really the photo I took when I signed up for Clear? Because it doesn't really look like me. Like, I actually had dark hair then and didn't look anything like me. And that's what's happening in China is that the consumer is saying, I don't really want to be identified with that image of myself. And with masks, it's becoming more difficult for facial recognition to recognize people. So what we see happening with this application for more innovation is actually going to augmented reality, where there will be an avatar that you will identify your photo with, and that avatar is what will come up to push that even further. But from a payments perspective, what's important to acknowledge is that again, payments are now becoming part of the everyday life of that consumer 
and an ongoing stream. So again, it's not a specific end state and a transaction. So somebody over here, who I can't see, talked about cars earlier, and we actually do see that, that the boundary of payments is moving into the car. This example is from Land Rover, where they introduced in 2017 the ability for your, your car to do automatic payment when you are getting gas. So you go and you get gas, you don't have to get out of your car. If you're in New Jersey, they pump your gas and you don't get out of your car and you won't have to pay because the car will sense that it's getting gas and will automatically trigger that real-time payment um, and then transfer it back to your credit card or whatever token you have put into the application. So that's step one from looking at the car as a device that can now operate within the economy um, as, as a device that can accept payment and can generate value. Option, there we go. Option two is how this is developing that fast is in Jaguar's case, they now have developed and put into their car the ability for that Jaguar to earn cryptocurrency. And how they do that is you see here on the screen the application that is now in that Jaguar. It allows you to automate and to select the ability that if you're driving along on the road and you go over a pothole and you report it back to the highway department, you earn a credit for doing that. You can see here as well, if you decide as an owner that you want to make your car available for vehicle sharing, you select that and then you say, okay, I'm ready to let my car be available for vehicle sharing. And then all of a sudden you're earning credit and dollars for that vehicle sharing at the same time. So this car is now moving beyond just having a nice screen to actually using that screen to, um, to collect cyber cryptocurrency and be able to then utilize that back to the consumer. So in many ways, this car is now going from just a, a car that takes you from point A to point B, but beyond just an autonomous vehicle to actually being able to earn income for that consumer. Then we take that one step further and we see that how Audi is um, evolving its ability to use the car as part of the economy and earn credits is that they're using the, the tolling system as the Trojan horse. In the US, if you're driving around from state to state, and every state pretty much had its own toll system, so its own easy pass. So if you rent a car, you're paying the car rental company for the use of that easy pass that's in the, in the car. So now if you own an Audi, they are now standardizing, however they did this, one toll system across the entire US, regardless of what that state actually uses. So in the back end, they're negotiating with all the different state systems and infrastructure, but as a consumer, I don't care. I turn on my toll thing in Audi and I just drive away, and all that payment stuff happens in the back end in as much real time as possible. And in Audi's case, the reason they're thinking of this as a Trojan horse is that they are now seeing this as a way, again, to establish infrastructure to help that consumer generate income out of the car and being able to use that in many different ways. So last car example, I promise, is in... Mercedes case, as they push the envelope for user experience, they're using quite a bit of different ways of authentication from voice to face to fingerprint to pin. And again, I use the Clear app as an example. Clear started as a TSA device to get through security. You kind of authenticate it at the beginning. It's the easiest thing ever if you're not a Clear person to go join. There's never a line. You go through. You use your fingerprints or your eyes and you're done. But what they, Clear has now done, similar to what Mercedes is doing from a user experience, you now store your vaccination card on Clear. And there's a QR code that people can look at. You now can register to attend a sporting event on Clear. 
and register your ticket so that you go through automatically. You can do it in um, a concert to make sure that you're cleared to go. So that ability to use different methods of authentication and tie that authentication back to that user experience is going across not just cars, but in many other, many other applications as well. So all these examples that I just talked about has really talked about, shown that the physical moment of the transaction is actually um, vanishing. In the 2000s, we saw for the first time this idea of self-checkout. And again, I don't know about you, but I hate those self-checkout things because they never, ever work. You put something in and they tell you, oh, that's not the right place. Help is coming. Well, if help is coming, they just should have let me give my stuff to help to check out to begin with, right? But if you've been to a CVS lately, and if you have time to go walk around, in, in CVS, they are doing away with all of the humans that sat behind that counter and let you check out. And all they have are these self-checkout devices. So it's taken from the year 2000 to 2021 for them to become ubiquitous in organizations. In 2011, we saw Uber integrate payment into the experience of getting into a car and getting from one place to another. For me, it's the best because I never have to think about pulling out my credit card, doing anything. You get in the car, you get out, and you're done. In 2015, we saw the same thing happen for online food delivery. And in 2017, 18, it was the scan and go from the um, Amazon kind of go store concept and several other stores. And we believe that by 2025, authentication will be the payment. So as you authenticate, whatever tokens or cards you've set up in the background will now be the way that you pay for anything that you want to consume or any activity that you want to do. The important thing to take away from this slide is what the title says, that the physical moment of transaction is vanishing and it will no longer be an isolated event, but rather will be part of the overall consumer's experience. So what does that mean? It means that faster payments must proliferate around the globe. And we think that there's over 50 different payment systems and payment infrastructure being developed around the globe. And the necessity for those to go faster and faster and faster is becoming more, um, more visible and more important as we go on. So I've talked about current, the past, I've talked about the future, and now let's come back um, to the present and talk about a couple of examples of how organizations now are addressing this need that consumers have and the trends that I've talked about. Deutsche Bank is doing something pretty interesting in that they are seizing payment um, initiation opportunities. They have partnered with the ITA so that they are actually, when a consumer books a, a, a ticket for airline travel, rather than it going through the credit card and the airline waiting for, for it to clear for a couple days and then getting their funding, what happens in this case is that agreement is that when the consumer books their airline ticket, Deutsche Bank is automatically clearing that and paying the IATA instantaneously so that there is no delay in clearing. And what does this mean longer term? The intent is that it will motivate consumers to do more of their transactions this way and will reduce some of the prices that airlines charge because there won't be all the little cuts that happen along the way from credit card vendors, et cetera, that it will eventually lower the price of those airline tickets. We also found that throughout the pandemic and f when the PPP was announced in the US as one of the um, pandemic economic, economic, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Economic situations and, and services that we found that banks really responded pretty quickly. Within four days, certain banks were able to take uh, applications 
for PPP and start initially issuing payment. And then we found that this um, interesting application came from Sterling Bank, where there were many people that were shut into their house during the pandemic and could not shop and were not comfortable in terms of using online grocery shopping at the beginning. So Sterling Bank, within 48 hours, developed this, multi, this MVP product in that they created this um, credit card where my mother, if she wanted me to go shopping for her, since she lives in assisted living, could, could go on this website, um, put link together to her, her bank account, issue this credit card to me, and I could now go shopping on her behalf. So it made that whole process a lot less risky to those consumers that were shut in and enabled them to um, actually authorize a third person to shop on their behalf. And finally, we saw that consumers use person-to-person -person payment everywhere. And we saw that those person-to-person -person payments really accelerated in use. And one of the reasons for that is that the pandemic um, exposed so many issues with the infrastructure that we have that people believe they had no choice but to find a different way to transact business and to actually pay for the things and the goods and services that they needed. And across the bottom, you can see all the different, um, all the different pay payment types and what's happened over time. Um, and while you still see that 39% of people have yet to use them, you'll see that the, the ones that are actually increasing in payment are Zelle and, and Venmo. And I didn't want to lose this stat. Um, in that Q3 of 2020, through Zelle, $84 billion in assets and payments went through Zelle in Q3 of 2020 for 323 million transactions. That's pretty significant in the amount of transactions that Zelle processed in a very short period of time in that beginning part of the, right after the pandemic started. And we believe that we'll continue to see this trend going forward. So it's no surprise then that digital payments have been gaining ground on credit cards. And you'll see here the red box shows you how, where digital payments are in relation to credit card uses and to cash. And while credit card usage still remains pretty consistent, I don't know about you, but I haven't spent money on anything in probably a year. I have the same $60 in my wallet that I've had for a year. And why do you th think that is, is that people have this perception that the risk from COVID is a lot higher to take money out of my wallet that I've touched, hand it to somebody to touch it, and they are going to give you change that they've touched it. And then you have to use hand sanitizer to put it back in your wallet. So even for a $2 item, what happens? You whip out the credit card, you use Apple Pay, and, and then you're off and going, and it's much safer. So we expect that trend to continue as well, where the amount of time that people use cash will continue to decrease, and digital payment methods will continue to increase. However, credit cards um, and financial institutions are not going to give up easily. And one of the things that while we talked about how the behavior is changing, one of the things that credit cards and financial institutions have in their favor is about trust. And if you look at this slide, you'll see that a credit card network and a bank consumers still perceive of those as being more trustworthy than any of the other payment methods. Now, some of that is from all of the, um, the breaches that have happened and the issues that have happened, including Facebook going down yesterday. But earning that kind of trust is not easy. And it means that those banks and credit card companies have a beachhead where they can work from to go into more of the digital payment 
um, the digital payment situation. And you'll see banks such as Bank of America really partnering with Zelle to enable them to have that footprint in digital payments. But as you think about going forward into real-time payments to understand that trust is as important um, in that payment operation and having that consumer trust is as it is in the ease of that transaction. At Forrester, when we think about a consumer's experience, we think about three, we call it three E's. E, three E's, 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 E apostrophe S. E's, the ease of doing it, the expectation, do I get what I want from it, and will I come back again for that? for that. So from that, from that situation, trust becomes very, very important. So when we think about COVID-19, and here we are 18 months in, and we thought we would be done by now, and hopefully we're close, but COVID-19 ushers in more experimentation for consumers and not less. So I talked about the beginning, this idea of loss aversion, and as we get more and more into COVID-19, the length of time that um, consumers have experimented with new ways to think about payment and have had positive experiences meant that they're more likely to stick. And as we continue to evolve as a, as a society, you find that consumers will be pushed to experiment more. And this idea of hyper-adoption will come into the foray that your consumers, as you think about how to interact with them, they underestimate the amount of experimentation that they will um, need to do. So I just wanna leave you with just a few thoughts that no one really wants a better payment experience. I don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, how can I have a better payment experience today? You know, whether it's payment, point of sale, receipts, employers, marketing, it doesn't really matter. I don't really think about it. What I do want is an easier way to buy a car. Maybe I want to buy my car totally online and then have it show up on a flatbed. Maybe I want to put a token into a vending machine and have the car show up. I don't know how that actually works, but looks good on, on um, a, a TV commercial and an advertisement. But what they do want is a better shopping experience. They want, consumers want to understand that their shopping experience will be easy and feel good, have good emotional resonance for them from start to finish without having a glitch on the payment side. So that payment side has to be totally transparent for that consumer and in the flow of their day-to-day -day life. So just um, a couple of key takeaways to start by identifying your customer's moment of need before imagining future experiences. Every day, something um, new comes up in terms of payments. So I have my phone up here because there was something today, two things that, that got, three things that got announced today. YouTube ex is expanding its shoppable ads to viewing on TV screens. So now you'll be able to shop YouTube ads on TV screens. So that is now the future of that customer experience. Amazon will now let Prime members send gifts to other people with just an email address or a phone number. So no longer going through the whole Amazon experience. And then SeatGeek, which is an organization in the US that lets you buy tickets to events, um, will will now introduce a new level of service into planning that cost, which they will offer credits for any tickets unused within 48 hours, but will also allow you to buy new tickets within 24 hours at the price without an uplift. So lots of every day you look and there's new announcements of new ways of thinking about payments and getting into real time and making it part of that overall experience for consumers. The consumer's appetite for new experiences is heightened by the pandemic, not, by, not dampened by it. And the last one, I skipped the middle one for a reason. Real time is actually a part of our digital lives and payments just need to catch up. And the thing I wanna close 
with and leave you with this idea is that we, technology has actually slowed us down in our ability to deliver real-time payments to consumers. If you think way back to the future and you look at this picture, thousands of years ago, we did real-time payment. I had a thing that I wanted and I walked up to a human that had the thing and I gave them something and I took the thing. So that was real-time payment. And now all these other things have gotten in the way of that. And now it's all of our jobs to get back to the future and enable real-time payments to actually f work at the speed of life. So I hope that was helpful to, for you today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I'll be here for about another 20 minutes or so. If anyone has questions, happy to answer those questions. Thank you.